you can't really fully look forward with eyes open unless you've looked back and spent some time back there and healed the stuff that you weren't able to heal when you were a tween. You didn't have the resources. You didn't have the safe space to do that. Maybe your parents weren't therapists and sat you down and you know, held space for your healing. I am here with a woman named Christine Hassler, uh, host of a podcast called Over It and On With It, author, speaker, uh, master coach, meditator, and uh, from what I gather, all around badass, and wife of Steph Sifandos, who was recently on the show. So it's Really good to have you here. Uh, thanks for taking the time with me. Oh, well, thank you for taking the time with me and being so patient with all my rescheduling as I'm navigating my way in new motherhood. Uh huh. Of course. Yeah. New motherhood. I am definitely interested in talking about that journey with you, uh, hearing what your experience has been like, and, and hearing how the masculine can support uh, the feminine um, in a time like this because it's very relevant for me in my life right now. Yes, so thank very you. Excited. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're very excited. Um, so I think maybe a good place to start would be how did you get here? I, I did a little bit of research on your Instagram, looking at who you are and what you are up to in your life. And overall, it looks like you are winning at every angle. Uh, you were married to an amazing man. Um, you became a mother at the time that you wanted to become a mother and uh you have a successful career you've done a lot in your life you're a master coach you're doing this elementum thing with um lexi and preston and staff which i don't know how you folks are doing this you're all parents and you're running this master coach yeah. institute we have, we have just one so yeah yeah amazing i'm really impressed with you folks and um yeah i want to hear like how did you get here how did you create a life, a dream life like this and, and attract a, a partner like, uh, Steph? Well, I didn't do it all at once. I think that's mm -hmm. a really important thing to say is it didn't mm -hmm. come all at once. Um, and I'm reminded you can have it all, maybe just not all at the same time. <laughs> and it's been an important thing for me. And especially for the women listening, I got married and had my first baby naturally in my forties. So, mm -hmm. I, I think one thing that helped me get to where I am is I didn't make decisions based on time or timelines mm -hmm. and really, really trusted that, and this was hard at times. It definitely was hard at times, but really trusted that like my destiny would unfold in the, in divine timing. And if I made a decision just out of fear of running out of time, especially when it came to marriage and kids, I knew that that would be the wrong decision. And I had some experience with that because Steph is actually my second husband. I was married before. I got married when I was, I don't know, like 27 because I wanted to be married before 30. That was back uh -huh. when I stepped into the timelines. Yeah. And I have nothing bad to say about my ex-husband. He's a wonderful person. He was just a journey mate, not my side-by-side -side partner to do the rest of life with. Um, mm -hmm. But a big part of what made me make that decision was it was what I was supposed to do. It was the right time. And so I learned some incredibly valuable lessons from that. Um, so many lessons. But in terms of the career, you know, I started coaching people in 2004. So I've been doing this a while. Mm -hmm. And back when I was started coaching, when I said I was a coach, people would ask me what sport because yeah. they didn't have any concept of what, <laughs> what a life coach is. And now you throw a rock and you hit a life coach. There's just so yes. many of us out there. Especially in Austin. Especially in Austin. Right, right. Um, <laughs> and it, it, I think that I, I could take the whole podcast sharing the journey, which I don't think is that interesting. The most valuable <laughs> piece I think I can share is that my own personal development has been the thing that has led my career. Mm -hmm. Outer experience is a reflection of inner reality. And the more I, I don't want to say worked on myself because it makes us sound like a home improvement project, but the more I went deeper into my consciousness, my healing, looking at my wounding, looking at the generational patterns I wanted to break, looking where I was getting caught up in my stories, looking where 
trauma was still running my life and I was still really coming from a reactive versus responsive place in my life and just investing so much. I've invested so much more into my own personal development than I have even as my own business mm. or anything else in my life. And so I think because of that, there's also there's always been a huge degree of integrity. I've always been my own best client and opportunities. I've sought some out, but some have also come to me. And I think that's a direct reflection of just embodying the work and doing the work. Mm. And you know, I, I haven't been afraid to take risks. That's the other thing. I, I always think, you know, I'd rather take a risk than have regret. Now I'm a cautious person. You will not find me bungee jumping. You will not find me downhill bike racing. <laughs> you will not find me going to Vegas and betting all my money. Um, but when it comes to taking risks for things that really matter to me, I just rather would have like risk it than regret. So I've, I've asked for things. I've put myself out there. I, you know, rejection was one of my core wounds growing up. Mm. Um, I got bullied, teased. There was, I hate Christine club. It was school and peers was really, really hard for me. And I, I really was intentional about healing that wound. And I'm glad I did because I know I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't healed that because I'd be so afraid of getting rejected. I never would have put myself out there. I never would have pitched myself to speak corporately or, or pitch myself to write a book or any of those things. So I had to get comfortable with notes and not seeing it as rejection. And that, that came mm. from the work as well. And then finally, I, I just have been clear about what success means to me. There's been many times where I've had business coaches, people with good intentions telling me I should do something for my business. Like I should do a webinar funnel or I should post uh -huh. more on social media or I should do this or I should do that. And when something doesn't feel good, now, granted, there have been things in my business I've done that aren't in my zone of genius that I don't really enjoy that just needed to be done to get to the next place. Yeah. But if the whole thing didn't feel good to me, like to me, doing webinar funnels and all the, uh, 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 mm -hmm. uh, it just always made me. Uh. And so I've looked at success as not how many followers do I have or how much money am I making, but am I feeling abundant, feeling like I'm in my zone of genius, like I am contributing, like I am serving, but I'm not doing a ton of stuff I don't want to do. Yeah. Could I have more followers? Yes. Could I be making more money? Yes. But what it would take for me to do that, I'm not willing to do. Yeah. And so yeah. my definition of success is not feeling burnt out, not feeling stressed, not doing a ton of stuff that I don't want to do. And that has been helpful. And then finally, in answering to your questions, how did I get to where I am? A lot of great coaches a lot of great teachers, mm -hmm. a lot of great people that were there to hold me when I fell down and also there to like kick me in the butt when I was wrapped up in my pity parties or whatever it may be. Um, and there have been many of them, many of them. And I wouldn't be here today without my own teachers and coaches. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. Thank you for that. If I could just <clears throat> reflect back a little bit on what you said there um, in terms of people coming into your life, it's almost like you never really know why people are in your life until, until you're really deep in it or until the relationship's gone or until you're really deep in it or until just the end. I don't know. But I had a friend once say to me, you know, people come into your life for one of three reasons, a reason, a season or forever. Yeah. And sometimes you think a person is forever. And they were actually just there for a reason. Yes. You were there to learn something from that person. You were there to, to integrate some lesson. And sometimes people are just there because it's summer, <laughs> you know, or the, a particular season of your life while you're in med school or whatever you're doing, you know, and, and then they're not going to be in your life any longer. And learning to accept that people sort of fall into their own categories and that sometimes you can't just force them into one of those categories and just letting it be what it is and embracing the the reality of it. So I think that's, that's beautiful. It's a beautiful way to look at, um, a marriage that ended and integrate the lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it really felt complete, you know, mm -hmm. it's even, and, and I went through my own shame and felt like a failure and, you know, I'm not saying it was like this, like totally conscious uncoupling and I didn't have any issues with it. And I just moved mm -hmm. on gracefully. It took me years to get over. And I actually wrote my third book, Expectation Hangover, um, it was inspired by that, by that divorce because no one gets married expecting to get divorced. 
Yeah. Um, and the book isn't about marriage or divorce. It's about when things don't go like you planned and, and how you use that, how you really leverage that, how you leverage disappointment into an opportunity to transform. Because what I've seen as a coach is that people don't come to me because their life is going great. People come to me because they're disappointed about something. Mm-hmm. And that's where the juice is. That's where the work is. That's where the opportunity is. And that's how life gets us. Because if everything's going great, we're not going to dive into the deep end and do our shadow work and do our trauma work and everything. And so life forces us to evolve through harsh conditions. You know, mm-hmm. it's with anything in nature. It, mm-hmm. the, a species survives and, and evolves through harsh conditions. If everything's too easy, we don't get the upgrades. Yeah. So to me, as much as I don't love expectation hangovers or disappointment, when they come, I know, all right, like, let's, let's, let's get ready to dive in because there's some beautiful opportunities for healing and transformation here. Yeah. There's an opportunity there. There's always, I had a a wise man tell me once, you know, a lot of times you have to have a breakdown in order to have a breakthrough. Of course. You know, someone was having a breakdown. We're like, they're having a breakdown. He's like, well, breakthrough is just around the corner. Yes, that's true. And, you know, in, uh, I, I've done a lot of work with addictions and there's an old adage that you kind of have to hit bottom before you're, you really muster what it takes to overcome your addiction, which is, you know, for a lot of people, the biggest battle of their lives is the hardest struggle. And you've got to hit your bottom. You've got to really have enough. And that usually means that your darkest days, losing the thing you thought you would never lose in some way. And the opportunity rises out of that. So, um, so you work with people to build from that ground up. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I work with people and, and wherever they are, you know, like I've worked with people of ages 13 to 70 uh-huh. <laughs> and all gender is all like from all different parts of the world. And I didn't start, I started out just working with people in their twenties. My first book's 20 something, 20 everything. And I was an expert on millennials and generational diversity and did the whole corporate speaking world and that for many years. Um, because I started coaching people when I was just a baby, I was like in my early twenties and I, you know, I wasn't qualified to coach anyone, not in their twenties. So Uh, that was my first, my first niche, but now it's, Everybody's welcome. There's nothing. I feel like I've seen everything at this point. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious how you, you know, I think sometimes people see a coach, like uh, you go to see a coach to like get your tires pumped up, you know, mm-hmm. just get, get rallied. And uh, you go to see a therapist or a counselor, to, like do the deep work, but <clears throat> being coached myself and knowing uh, you and Preston and, and uh, staff and, and the type of work that people do. Uh, that's not true. And, but how do you, how do you coach someone so that it sticks? How, how are you a coach that doesn't just pump people's tires and then send them off? You know, how do you, how do you help people really like integrate the changes that they're trying to make, uh, working with you? Well, I can't, like I tried out for cheerleading and I was always rejected from it or in the back row. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not a motivational speaker type person. I, it's just not in my, it's just not who I am because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I want the, I want the work that lasts and that's the work I've always resonated with too. And, and, you know, I'm a coach and I also have my master's degree in spiritual psychology and another one in consciousness, health and healing. And so I have a very, and trained in like inner child work and and so many mod- trauma and so many modalities that have have to deal with the past and from my perspective in order to go forwards you have to go backwards like you have to go back and clean up a lot of the things from our past before we can really step into the life that we that we really want to do mm-hmm. so for me um it's like I just I just can't do a pep talk one because I just don't really know how to do it because some some things have to feel authentic to me. Now I can totally cheer someone on if that's what they need in that moment and that's what's aligned and that's what's authentic. But I it feels totally out of integrity to me to pump someone up and then a day later, four hours later, a month later, all their stuff comes back around because we never really dealt with the core issue. Um, and this was a lesson I had to learn as a coach because when I first started coaching, luckily my coach Mona. Who was coaching me on how to coach when I first started when I was a baby in my twenties? Mm-hmm. 
was like, if you feel either high or low after a session, you've messed up. Because right. if you feel low, like you're you're putting too much pressure on yourself and you're working harder than the client and you're being too critical. And if you feel high, then you're in your ego and you you pump them up in some way and you actually really do do them a service and you made it more about you wanting them to have a good result than really giving them what they need. Yeah. And so where I come from is like, what does this person need? Do they need a little air in their tires? Like, do they actually really need that? Or is that just masking a deeper issue? Hmm. And you know, that's why I have the podcast over at Non With It where I coach people live on the air because I want people to be able to listen to a coaching session and see that it's not about goal setting. It's not yeah. about just motivating. It's actually about doing the deep work. And sometimes therapy is more appropriate. Um, but a lot of times the places I can get to with the experience and skills and training that I have is to, it's like to connect the dots. I kind of see myself as a detective. Okay, there's something in your life Mm -hmm. That's a problem now, or that's an issue now. It didn't just start now. This has threads, most likely to your childhood. And we can talk, we can waste your time and money and talk about this current day problem, or we can go back and see where the seeds were planted that are creating this now, because this current day problem or expectation hangover, whatever we want to call it, is, like I said earlier, it's coming to your awareness so that you go back and deal with something that you didn't, you couldn't deal with, you didn't, you didn't have the tools to deal with. You know, if we think of trauma or challenges or things that happened to us as a kid, often we didn't have the right people around, the right things weren't said to us, we weren't taught how to deal with our feelings. And so things just get buried and we recreate similar experiences so that we can actually heal and, mm -hmm. and deal with what happened back then. So that's always my work as a coach is to go, hmm, where can we connect the dots here? And where can we put the puzzle pieces together? And how can we use whatever problem or issue you're bringing to me right now to look at, all right, where can we go back and do some deep healing work so that you don't keep having the same problem over and over and over again? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Real change comes from the core. So if you're having trouble changing something from the surface level, just by trying to force it or trying to arrange the chairs or the stage around you, go deeper look deeper, sure. go back farther. Yeah. Real change happens when we change, you know, using my example of rejection, it's like the outside world didn't change, right? Hmm. I still kept getting no's. I still yeah. kept liking people that didn't like me back romantically. I still kept yeah. not getting invited to certain things. Um, but my reaction to it changed because I went back and did the inner child work with that tween and, and went back and told her she didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. And it wasn't her fault and let her have her feelings about it and let her have her anger about it and gave her what she didn't get then so that that was, that was healed. It wasn't just a bandaid, but the wound actually healed. And so when a similar trigger would come, I didn't time travel back to that 12 year old girl. That's why so many of us have a reaction that's often bigger. It doesn't match the circumstances, you know, like you didn't get invited to a dinner and all of a sudden you have a panic attack and you're like, wait, I didn't just get invited to dinner and I'm having this huge reaction. Why does my reaction not really match the reality of what's going on? It's because mm -hmm. it's triggering something from our past and you've time traveled and you're not your 35 year old self. You're that 12 year old girl who feels alone and like something's wrong with her and, and her sense of belonging is threatened. And when our sense of belonging is threatened, it, it hits the primal part of our brain and we, our sense of survival is then threatened. So there's this cascading things that, Life is always giving us the opportunity to, to look at and heal. But the problem is we just want a quick fix. We yeah. just want like, what's the solution to my problem right now? Like I've been single for years. Tell me how I find my person. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we got to talk about your childhood. No, I don't want to do that. Just tell me what I need to wear or what I need to put on my profile so I can get yeah. the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give me a better dating app. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 If I just change my hair color, you know, we, we, yeah. we want the quick, and I want the quick fix. Believe me, I'd love that. Um, but I'm, and, and here, I, I do want to say some things can change quickly. There's some things we can just decide to change and boom, they can transmute. Mm -hmm. And most things take a little more time and effort than that. Yeah. I think the core message that I'm hearing from you is, and, and this is an important message that our generation is receiving is that the past is the past is not true. That's not, th this is how my parents and my grandparents lived right. was that like, 
if it's past, if it's history, it's gone. You don't have to talk about it ever again, and it's never going to affect you in the present. You just keep your eyes headed to where you're going, and that's how life works. Nope, that's actually not how life works. It works the way you just described, which is that we're actually always rehashing the past in our minds and we're taking characters from our past and we're projecting them onto the people in front of us and around us. And, you know, there's a saying, if it's historical, it's hysterical, right? So if, if it reminds you of the past, it's going to activate you in a big way. And so the solution isn't for you to just get invited to the dinner party. It's their fault that they didn't invite you and your your reaction is all their fault. No, it's about your past and you have to dig into that. And you know, the word trauma as much as as it gets thrown around these days, it's a pointer at our past and it's it's us pushing this button saying like no, no, like listen, we all need to deal with this. Like what's your trauma? Whatever it is, don't compare it to other people's. Just dig into it and go there, find a safe place to go there because that button, whether you like it or not, gets pushed by the world everywhere you go, your trauma is, is affecting you. And you can't really fully look forward with eyes open unless you've looked back and spent some time back there and healed the stuff that you weren't able to heal when you were a tween. You didn't have the resources. You didn't have the safe space to do that. Maybe your parents weren't therapists and sat you down and you know held space for your healing, right? It just wasn't the right time for you to do that. Uh, so we have to jump in the time machine and go back. We do. Because another yeah. saying that I constantly like to debunk is the time heals all wounds. Uh-huh. It doesn't. Time doesn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> it doesn't all. Just because it happened 50 years ago doesn't mean it's not affecting you now. Mm -hmm. And yes, time gives us space and things may sting a little less, but it's not time that heals wounds. It's our Mm -hmm. conscious intention. It's, it's doing the inner work. It's, it's actually love that heals all wounds. And it, 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 to me, love is at the essence of everything that I do, you know, as my own student on the planet and all the work that I do as a coach, because it is going back. And I I really want to emphasize when we talk about going back into the past, we're not talking about going back and reliving it. You know, when we're, we're healing, let's say we're healing abuse. No, one's going to go, I don't, I I don't want to go back there. Like, I don't want that. That's over. I don't want to go back to that trauma. You don't have to, it's not about going back and regurgitating the memories and, and going through detailed processes of what happened and having all the visuals. It's not that It's more going back and getting that five-year-old little girl or boy that was abused out of the situation, giving them an opportunity to feel, to speak, to tell us what they need. It's not about reliving the experience. And I think that's what keeps people hesitant about therapy or coaching or any kind of trauma work because they don't want to relive it. And they think Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to relive it in order to heal it. So not true. You don't want to relive it. And if you are working with someone that's taking you back and having you go into detailed explanations and relive your trauma, I would consider switching modalities, switching person, because that can be Uh re-traumatizing. It's more about giving yourself, like honoring the feelings that weren't able to be expressed then, giving voice to that and giving yourself now what you didn't get then. It's it's like Mm -hmm. rescuing parts of yourself and bringing them into a safe space now. Yep. And having a conscious, loving witness present or witnesses to hold that for you, right? Because that the group or the coach creates this uh, environmental context between the two of you. And that context enables you to go places that you couldn't necessarily go alone. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and I love that you said that it's really about love because it, that's been my experience too, is that love is the, yeah. that's the healer. Right. And, and the wounding really came, comes from a place of not feeling love, feeling abandoned, feeling, um, hated, feeling hurt, um, mm-hmm. and unsafe and love yeah. seems to heal all of those things. Right. And it kind of makes sense that, um, MDMA therapy works so well for healing trauma because It takes the love that's present around you when you're in a a safe therapeutic environment and it puts it inside you 
you know, and all of a sudden you're like beaming and emitting love and everything in your thoughts is sort of flowering and open and loving. And, and then you can go to your darkest place and you're like, that light just penetrates into that dark box that you locked away and you can actually go there. You know, um, so that's one modality, but in a way I, I, I see the analogy because, um, you know, when I'm working with a guy, I'm, I'm just a loving witness there for him. And he might tell me about his darkest thing. And I just witness and give him love, ask him if he wants to feel his feelings, encourage him to just keep You're opening with me. me. Right. And that in itself is healing. Yeah. So it, it okay. So it's not that complicated. And we really just have to have the courage to, to go there. And yeah, the essence of the message that I've got from some of your work is that it pays off to go there. Yeah. It really pays off. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, not immediately always. and that's the other thing in our quick fix world. Like you don't expect to heal, heal your father wound and meet the love of your life the next day, you know, or, cool. or work on your money story. And then all of a sudden, like, your products online start selling and you're a millionaire. It does take yeah. time. The physical world reality is the densest layer. Like we can shift something on the emotional, mental, psycho, spiritual level and then kind of go, okay, well, where are my results? <laughs> like, yeah. If outer experience is reflection, reflection of inner reality, I've done my work. Where's my stuff? Mm -hmm. And so we have to realize that like it does sometimes take time to come up. But health stuff too. I mean, that's been a big thing for me. I've like worked so much and wanted health stuff, stuff to shift and change. And it just took a while. It just, mm -hmm. it just took a while for it to shift and change. You know, I had so many hormonal issues in my late twenties and thirties and did so much work on that aspect of my life. And then boom, got pregnant in my forties, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just, it, it we never um, want to get caught up in the like instant gratification and we're doing the work to have a different internal experience, not to get results. Uh -huh. the, the different results are amazing. It's icing on the cake. But having a different lived experience inside of us, mm -hmm. that's what we're really going for. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I'd love to transition into, um, you know, getting some of your thoughts on men's work, men, mm. how men can support women, um, you know, what does, what does the evolution of men look like to you? You know, what, what, do, what do conscious men of the future look like? And, uh, yeah, I'm curious what your, what your thoughts are on that. You know, what, what does so men's thoughts. evolution look like? <laughs> so many thoughts. So that's to cut me off. Well, let's see, let's start with one thing I've noticed is that there's been a lot of talk on how the role of women has changed and the mm -hmm. rise of the feminine and, you know, there's this new avatar of women of, of being a leader and being an entrepreneur and doing what we love and kind of the having it all type yeah. of thing. And there hasn't, I don't think, been enough conversation about how that's challenged men. And men mm -hmm. have kind of had to adapt to, okay, well, this is, this is new. This is different than what I saw generations of men doing. This is even different than primally what I'm conditioned to do. I'm conditioned primarily and biologically to be provider protector, but wait, she's doing all that. So where do I fit into this? And I want to be in my masculine energy, but I see she's also got a lot of that going on. And so where do we fit in? But I want to be sensitive, but not too sensitive because yeah. I still want to lead. And, and so I think um, it's been a time where both the masculine and feminine have been in this dance of really figuring out, okay, we're, we're coming into this new expression of ourselves and how do we fit together, right? And when we talk about masculine and feminine, we're not just talking about male, female, gender. We're talking about energetics, you know, yep. because in any relationship, you want polarity. So you can be, you know, two men in a relationship or two women in a relationship and you're still going to have those dynamics playing out. Yep. And so, you know, masculinity isn't just reserved for men, but generally speaking, male body people lean more towards masculinity and vice versa yep. for female. Um, and what, what I have found in terms of the, the, what defines the conscious man is simply said, the man who will do his work. Same with the conscious woman. Like it's, it's not how many books you read or how many mm. mala beads you have. It's more about like, have you done the deep work? And 
when I, when I talk about the work, I'm talking about our individual work, like the work I, Christine, have had to do based on my individual life and the work I'm doing on behalf of the collective, the uh-huh. work that I've done on just being a woman and things that I've, I've worked through that are co- collective issues, not just my issues to deal with. And I think that's up for men too, is really redefining what it means to be a man and also what it means to revere the feminine to really like revere the feminine inside themselves and in the expression of a partner. Um, Because I think men are wired to provide and protect, but something that's coming up in the consciousness and something that's been really up for me in my relationship with my husband after having a baby is the reverence, is the devotion. And that I think has been something that was way, way, way back in history. Women were very revered. There was a lot of devotion and we're kind of coming back around in that. And men are like, well, how do I do that but not lose myself? How do uh-huh. I do that? And still, like, I value freedom. I value autonomy. I value, like, my, doing my own thing. How do I, you know, balance all of these things? And that's the opportunity that I see men have right now is, yes, doing the work. Yes, their internal work and the collective work. But really – looking at what does it mean to revere the feminine, both inside me and externally. Because I think a lot of men are disconnected from their feminine energy. You know, healthy masculinity to me means you're in touch with your feminine energy too. Mm -hmm. If you're not in touch with your feminine energy and and know how to use it and know how to express that side of you and and heal any wounds that you have in, in, in terms of the feminine inside of yourself, then you're more in the shadow masculine. You're you're over dominated in that masculinity Uh and the healthiest masculine to me is, is also in in touch with his feminine as well. And I think that's what helps women feel safe is yes, we want that strong masculine presence, but we want also want access to that, that feminine, which is more the nurturing, open-hearted, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. We still have that leadership, but also have access to that. And when we don't feel that, it, it 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 kind of feels like we don't have access to the heart space. Uh-huh. And I think for, for us to feel safe, it's like we need that access to the heart space because that's how we can like relax and let go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's not really a fullness there without the feminine. There's a... Right. I suppose if I imagine a man who's in zero contact with his feminine side, he's, um, might be strong, powerful in a number of different ways, like really create things like he's a he can create and destroy. He's got the warrior down, but the lover is missing because the, the lover, uh, at least in, in, in King Warrior Magician lover is seen as, to be like the feminine within the masculine archetypes. And he's disconnected from feeling he's disconnected from the heart. He's disconnected from intuition. And being able to like feel what the right thing to do is in the moment. And, oh, we need to change direction because I'm feeling, I'm sensing in my environment, I'm sensing in my partner that we need to shift here. And, or, you know, I'm feeling something and I need to speak about that. Or I'm feeling her because I can feel me, I can feel her. That's another thing is like, if you can't feel your own feelings, you're not going to be able to feel your partner. And I've learned as a man with a feminine partner that she wants that from me. She wants me to be able to at least empathize with what she might be feeling, even though I will never know what it's like to be a woman or carry a baby or uh, have a cycle or like all of the, the, you know, the emotional roller coasters that she goes on just to be able to get partway there. And without my feminine side, I can't. I'm just analytical, mechanical, and I'm focused on goals and getting things done and and, solutions. And Mm -hmm. yeah. And so she can't I can't feel her and then she can't feel me. And then she can't relax into me. Exactly. So I love what you're saying there about men needing to um get in touch with their feminine side. I it it's really interesting that you say that because I as I was waiting to hop on this call was posting on Instagram about a man doing his work to integrate his masculine and feminine oh. side. And I was linking to the the podcast I just released with John Wineland. And yeah. oh it's true that for me, like uh, 
that is one of the things I feel that opened me up uh, to the type of relationship that I wanted was learning how to dance, learning how to do a uh, more feminine type of breath work and like let uh, flow occur in my body and let my feelings fly and um, l- sit quietly even and just listen to my heart. What is my heart trying to say in a moment rather than what is my head trying to say, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's been tremendously helpful. So uh, yeah, that's beautiful. And this piece around revering the feminine, I loved. Um, mm. How, just to build on that, you know, how, what does leadership look like in this time where you're, where you're saying, yeah, women are learning to lead and men also want to lead, but don't you know, necessarily know how to do that. Part of it is like, yeah, a learning to balance your own energies and cultivating your sensitivity. But, um, you know, what are some of the things that have helped you in your relationship and your marriage in terms of, you know, you're both leaders, clearly. How do you make this relationship work? (laughs) (laughs) We don't always. always (laughs) For sure. I mean, we just went through a period where we're two weeks. We were just like, ready to, I don't know. We were at each, not at each other's throat, but we were just like not liking each other very much. Mm-hmm. And we finally came back around and I, I will say Steph usually leads the repair. I'd like to say it's because he's usually wrong, but it's, it's, it's honestly because, <laughs> because, you know, he really holds the masculine pole. And so one of the kind of, uh, we haven't ever verbally said this agreement, but we've, we've talked about it is that if he leads the repair, like if he comes to me in effort to repair, I will be receptive. Uh And that's really worked well for us in our dynamics is that if there's an argument, if there's something up, he will, he will lead the repair. He will come to me and, and I will remain in that feminine receptive energy and say, okay, I'm open to, to this. Um, And that's really what's gotten us through so many arguments because the roles are clear and the agreements are clear. Now, Mm -hmm. if he were to come to me and I was more in my hurt and I said no to the repair, right, then that would mess up the whole dynamic. So I think in relationship, there's there's different areas that you're going to lead in. There's some areas in our relationship where I lead. Like, for example, I'm... He's more the risk taker. He's more the spontaneous. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's do it. Like the bright, shiny, big idea person. And I'm like, well, let's break it down and come back to reality and really talk about if this is going to work or not. So often with big decisions, I may lead those conversations because I'm more of a realist. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. it just works. But I love that he leads our dreams. You know, he really leads our visions and leads our dreams and helps us think bigger. So I think within every dynamic, within every relationship, you've got to look at, okay, who is good at leading what? Like, what are you going to lead? What am I going to lead? And it's not so much, well, you're the man or you hold the masculine pole, so you lead this. And I'm the female and I hold the feminine pole or I hold the feminine pole. And so I'm going to lead this. It's really where do we naturally shine and can we put our egos aside and go, actually, you lead better in that direction. Yeah. 100%. Hundred percent. It's humbly. about mm-hmm. humility. Yeah, it's about humbly acknowledging where you lead best and where your partner leads best, and acknowledging your differences. Right. I, imagine what trouble you two would get into if you were both big ideas persons, people, and uh, neither of you was very practical. there'd be a a line of destruction behind you, you know, it'd it'd be a big mess. It's actually a beautiful thing that, that Mm -hmm. one of you is a big ideas person and the other person is, you know, back to reality, practical. I'm it's opposite in our relationship. Uh, Shalina is big ideas. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Shalina throws the ideas and then I see if like I can stick them to something. <laughs> right? See I love it. the way you phrase it much better because he calls himself the dreamer and me the dream squasher. And I'm like, I don't <laughs> like that title. 
dream squasher. <laughs> well, that's uh, that is how it feels to the dreamer when someone I takes know. their dreams I and know. tries to put them into I the know. smaller box of reality. Right, the land of dreams is the biggest land, you know, but uh, physical sure. reality is is much more constrictive. And there's laws of the universe that that you know things have to fit into. Um, but if you can learn to respect each other's roles and work as a team, I think. Um, that is what this is all about is like finding, you know, yeah, you, you both lead in different ways and, um, yeah. and, and, and I think the best way to lead is by example, you know, like if mm -hmm. I want him to change or be different in any way, am I taking responsibility from my side of the street? And so I've noticed, you know, we have shifts in our relationship when one person just really does their work. And leads by example. And instead of me expecting him to be a certain way in the relationship, me wanting him to be more romantic, for example. Well, okay, mm -hmm. well, I'll, why don't I do that? Why don't I own that? Why don't I take responsibility uh -huh. for it and lead by example? Mm -hmm. And then it calls forward him. So that's another thing to always keep in mind is, is am, I, am I looking for someone to lead me or do I want to lead by example? Mm -hmm. I'm curious if Steph is the more anxious person in your relationship or, or uh, the, the more avoidant person. Oh, I'm anxious. He's avoidant. You're the anxious. Yeah. So the interesting thing here is that he's the one approaching you for repair, which means he's going against his instincts. Yeah. And and I'm the same way. I'm I'm the avoidant and and my partner is is more on the anxious side. Of course, we're both trending towards secure. But yeah. um my tendency is to uh be the turtle, wall up, pull everything into the shell, stonewall my partner and try to like get her back, you know, by yeah. shutting down. Yeah. And, uh, one of the things that I've learned to do is do is exactly what Steph's doing with you, which is sort of leaning towards you, leaning into the repair. Like, okay, okay, okay. As Steph, he's like, I need to approach her for the repair because I yeah. know she wants it. She's resisting reaching at me because she's working on being secure. And my work is to stop running the other direction and turn towards her because that's my yeah. commitment to this relationship. That's my commitment to love. That's my commitment to being a more secure partner. And so I'm going to approach her and initiate the repair. I think that's a, there's a beautiful lesson there, right? Because that is what he needs to do. And what your job is as the anxious person is to not chase him, right? And focus on your own self-soothing and just giving a little bit of space. Because actually when you give him space, he feels he feels a little bit more warm about turning towards you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's that cat and mouse game that all of our unconscious minds are playing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very cool. I, I think um Yeah. And for me, a big indicator that I am moving more towards secure is when we are off, I can still be very settled. Like my nervous system isn't dysregulated. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not like grasping to fix it. Or grasping to, you know, have that like reassurance. Like it, I'm okay uh -huh. with being in um, the disruption for a bit. Right. And for someone with, you know, an anxious attachment style, that's a huge sign of moving more towards that secure is that you can self-regulate and you can self-soothe and you don't need your partner to fix it for you or tell you it's okay. Right. Yeah. So you can spend two weeks yeah. in a space where you're not really happy with your relationship. It's not really ideal, but you're not panicking. You're exactly. staying calm. <laughs> beautiful yeah um so there was this piece as well around um f for men trying to deal with um being in relationship with uh a powerful woman who's a leader in a time where um things are confusing and you know how do men lead? Something that came through while you were sharing as well was about the fact that this isn't simple and that there aren't predefined roles that we can all just fall into is the opportunity. It's a challenge, but it's also what we get from freedom. You know, like I, I look at Mad Men, watch Mad Men, and realize um, what 
a shitty world that would be compared to the current one that I'm in. <laughs> Where like, you know, women had predefined roles and they didn't have rights and and they had a very small box that they had to live in. But men also had very small boxes that they had to live in because there was all these predefined roles for the genders. Mm -hmm. And there was a simplicity there. You just grow up to do what society tells you to do. And now we all have a lot more freedom to self-express and be whatever we want to be in the world. And that's the challenge. That's, that's yeah. the challenge and the opportunity. Yeah. Right. Is to figure that out. So there's no perfect formula. There's no book that's going to tell you exactly how to be in relationship with a powerful, dynamic uh, leader of a woman. Yeah. But it's a more uh, beautiful life, right? And and the oh, yeah. the mystery <laughs> the mystery is infinite. You're never going to fully figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And if I could give one piece of, for lack of a better word, advice to the men that want to be with or are with a strong, powerful woman, it would be mm. this. Mm. Remember, she still needs you. And what mm. I mean by that is often what I see, and I see I, so many of my girlfriends and I that are similar to me have this conversation, is they see us as so capable and so competent and handling everything that they forget that we need them. Like we need them to come in and take things off our plate. We need them to like just rub our feet at the end of the day. We need them to be like, you're doing a lot right now. Yeah. Like, what do you need from me? Um, and often when a woman is so caught up in her mission and her message and, and all of that, she can get a little bit imbalanced. Uh -huh. And get more in that masculine. And we often need our man to be like, hey, I'm here. You can lean back. Hmm. I've I've got you. I've really hmm. got you. And not take her for granted. And even and know even though she can and is capable of doing a gazillion things, she doesn't want to. And right. she'd love it if she takes some things off her plate for sure. Mm -hmm. And this isn't like a damsel in distress kind of thing. It's more like allow her to soften into her feminine um, and, and need you at times and be available yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, because that's the, the biggest thing that, that I have felt and that I've had so many conversations with similar woman, women is, you know, I love that he supports my vision and mission and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes I feel like I'm too capable, you know, yeah. and I've got, I've got it all too much handled and yes. I'd actually like him to handle more. Mm -hmm. So step in and lead and let her fall back into your arms. Yeah, that's beautiful. That is a clear example for me of the, the third stage of consciousness that David Data is talking about. You know, the first stage where we're really sort of obsessed with the external world and uh, exploring bodies and, and sort of getting what we want from the other. Yeah. And then the second stage being where we take a lot more responsibility for ourselves. We kind of get our shit together. We work on our own healing. We become more independent. Uh, we stop being such jerks to one another and, and um, learn to give in the world. And the shadow side of that side can be that we become so self-sufficient and yeah, we, we just become, we can become a silo, right? Yeah. An island. And the third stage being this place where you step into this place fully taken care of from your own end, but still wanting to be in relationship because that is a lovely dynamic and it's something you literally can't do by yourself. <laughs> it's, it, okay. it, there's a whole extra thing going on. No matter how independent you are, if you can get into a relationship with another person, you get to play a wider game, a bigger game, a, a, a larger spectrum in life. And so you can be a powerful, independent, self-sufficient woman who also would like to just relax into your partner's arms and be held and carried yeah. and, and loved yeah. up. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So 
the last larger subject I wanted to touch on with you here in this interview was um, really around parenthood. Mm. I, um, we're a couple months out here from uh, our pod of two becoming a pod of three. And um, my wife is going through a lot right now. And uh, I'm going through some things, not nearly as much, <laughs> most of it in my mind. Uh, my body is still the same. She's, she's going through a lot and I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on how men can support their partners mm -hmm. in, in the birth process and in the post birth process. Like what do you, what did you need most from your partner in, in those last few weeks during the birth process and then after postpartum? Um, honestly, to put aside his needs temporarily, um, there's so much that a woman sacrifices in pregnancy, birth, and especially postpartum, especially postpartum. Mm. And we become, uh, everything becomes in service to the child. And so to me, pregnancy, birth, postpartum is an opportunity for the man where everything becomes in service to the woman, mm. basically. Now, men are going, well, then what about me? <laughs> well, that's parenting because <laughs> by, by giving to the mother, you're giving to the child. And yeah. I'm not saying the men are not involved with the child as well, but it is, especially in the first year, I think it is a time when our needs do come second because we're devoted to this child. You know, I was talking recently about how I've had a spiritual practice for years, but I, I really didn't understand and fully embody the word and energy of devotion until I had my daughter. It's a whole new level of devotion, not just love, but devotion. Mm -hmm. And so for men, I mean, we're, I, I, I've had to put aside so many of my needs. Like I need to sleep. <laughs> That's not happening. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. so many things that, that we've had to put aside and so for men to be like, okay, I'm willing, I'm going to be in this with you. You're putting aside and you're sacrificing all this. I'm going to put aside my needs for a second, not for a second, for like a year, maybe more yep. Yep. and be devoted to you. Now that doesn't mean you don't, you never have self-care. You, you never do anything for yourself. You stop you know, running your business. It doesn't mean that, but it means more that kind of selfish, um, you know, I just want to do what I want when I want. And like, what about me? Those kind of needs and desires just get to put on pause for a little while. Mm -hmm. And what I have found, like Steph was really great in the pregnancy and birth. He was very, very present. He was very involved. He never missed an appointment. Um, he was always talking to, to, we called her Poppy when she was in the womb. Her name's <laughs> Athena Grace, but we called her Poppy. He was always talking to her. And I really felt like we were pregnant, you know, even mm -hmm. though it was going through the experience. And during the birth, which was 38 hours of labor, she was born at home. So it was a long time. And it was a pretty intense birth process. He was just, he was there. He was just there the whole time. And I had to do something pretty extreme um, at the end there. And he, I couldn't have done it without him. I really couldn't uh -huh. have done it without him. And at no point did he doubt me. Mm -hmm. And at no point, like the only people at our birth were the doula, the midwives, and my best friend of 20 years. And anytime he got scared because there was conversation of needing to be transferred to the hospital and there mm -hmm. were some scary moments, some intense moments, we'll call it. And yeah. he never brought that to me. He would go talk to my best friend. And when he showed up for me, he was like, you got this. Yeah. And him having that belief in, in me, um, that really helped. Um, postpartum, that's where we got a little, where it got a little clunky. Uh, the other thing I would advise anyone who's about to have a child or wants to have a child is make agreements before the baby comes hmm. around who is doing what, what level of support, what expectations are, how much I expect you around just super, super clear agreements. Um, because he took six weeks of a paternity leave, but what I thought his paternity leave was going to look like and what it looked like were two different things because right. we didn't have any clarifying conversations around that. Mm -hmm. So like really, really, really clear agreements. And both of you are going to grieve. Like you, it's, it's, it, it's this amazing experience where you feel all the feelings. Like I felt all this love of this, this being and you, you hold your baby and you're like, 
wait, this is my child. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just surreal. But at the same time, you're grieving your life because it will never be the same. Like it will mm. never be the same. And so we had to grieve our own individual lives. And we also had to grieve our relationship because our relationship is different now. We used to be the couple. It's like, let's go here this weekend. Let's just watch movies all night. Let's sleep till 10. Let's yeah. have ice cream for dinner. You know, we could just do whatever we wanted whenever we wanted. And we've had to refine each other with this new level of responsibility. And so we've had to grieve the relationship as well. So I'd also say make space for each of you for that. Uh-huh. Like make space for her being able to grieve and not have guilt about it. Like that was a big thing for me as a new mom. I have so much guilt when I would just be like, oh my gosh, I miss my old life. Like I miss sleeping. Or I'd have thoughts of like, why did I do this? And I'd feel immediate shame and guilt. Um, and so by him sharing too what he was grieving and normalizing it for me, it's like we got to talk about that and didn't have to keep it in the shadows. You know, we didn't have yeah. to keep it buried. So that was really helpful too. But now we really find our rhythm again and he's been more like showing up and like, what do you need? How can I help? And that's been so nourishing for me. And because he's been showing up that way and I feel more nourished, it's like I find myself making him lunch or saying, hey, do you want to go out with your friends? Mm -hmm. Or wanting to make sure he's getting his cup full because Mine has felt so empty being a new mom and by him showing up and kind of putting his needs aside for a moment, I want to then give to him. And so that's a dance that we've, we stumbled and we stepped on each other's feet a lot in the beginning and we're four and a half months in and now really finding our way. And also this kind of goes to the new sort of male, female, masculine, feminine dynamics you know, especially when you have a new baby, so much falls on the mom, especially if you're nursing. And we're like trying to keep this being alive, but also really recovering. Like it takes yeah. really a year to recover from birth. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. nurturing the mother is so much of focus is put on the baby, but nurturing the mother is super, super, super important. So that's the other thing I'd say is just make sure like, you know, just the basic creature comfort needs. Are really yeah. Oh, beautiful. Thank you for that. I was just like in a zone listening to you, downloading, trying to embed what you're sharing as deeply as possible. Um, you know, sacrifice, devotion, believing yeah. in her a hundred percent, um, setting agreements and constant check-ins is definitely something that I'm planning with her is like, weekly, like, Hey, how are we doing? What can I do more? What do you need more of? Um, and then, you know, sharing what's going on for me and just like having those clearing conversations so that we can constantly adapt. Cause I mean, I know also that things change week by week with, yeah. with a new baby. Um, yeah. And the other thing I think that was important for Steph and one more request I had to him is, you know, I'm usually your best friend and your support person, the pe- person you bring things to, but I can't hold your challenges through this right now because I'm just empty. And Mm. so whether it's your best friend or a coach or whatever, I'll come back around and I'll be that person again. But right now I can't be that person because there's so much changing for me and, and the hormonal shifts are massive. And, you know, one of our intentions is to speak more honestly about parenting, especially the beginning because I think people say, oh, you'll never be the same. It changes everything, but it's so great. And there aren't like a lot of real honest conversations about, yes, uh-huh. how beautiful it is, but also how hard it is, especially for people who are used to a certain degree of freedom in their life. You know, we had kids older in life. Our life was pretty set. We had a routine. And so it was a big, big, big change. And no one was really brutally honest with us, maybe because they didn't want to scare us. Um, But I think if we had more friends being like, okay, here's what to expect, we might have been more prepared. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, we are sufficiently anxious for sure because our highest ideal, uh, our highest priority other than community and relationship is freedom. So we're we know we're in for uh, an upset here. Well, um, call us. <laughs> yeah, we Here's will. Support. We will call. Yeah, um, and I I love the emphasis on the postpartum days as well and the regeneration that's needed. Shalina just got a book called The First Forty Days, 
And it's all these recipes that are geared towards uh, regeneration. I think it's very Chinese medicine oriented, Chinese Chinese food. And my hope and my plan for that first 40 days is just to devote myself to cooking for her for pretty much the whole time. Just constantly cooking, hold the baby, change a diaper, go back to cooking, sleep a little bit. If I'm yeah. lucky, right? And and the other thing I would say is be open to having support come in and have other people maybe do the cooking or some of mm-hmm. the cooking mm-hmm. or whatever. Because that's that's the one thing we did well. We had support and that was a game changer. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really a game changer because friends and family, it's great. Like you can count on it and it's, it's great, but that brings a whole new energetic to it. And mm-hmm. so one thing that I really put aside for was support in those first 40 days. And that was, um, that was a beautiful gift we gave ourselves because then we could really be together. Yeah. We are lucky enough to have a plan for that as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm super grateful. Uh, last question. Yes. We are, we're expecting a little girl and as a woman who was a little girl, I'm curious what you would say, you know, what, what do you think this little girl needs from me the most as a, as a father? And maybe, you know, if you want to split it into multiple ages, that might be easier, you know, age one, age five, age 10, I don't know, but. Well, I think throughout her whole life, no matter what age is just your presence. Hmm. I can already see Athena with Steph if he's with her and he's looking at his phone, which he doesn't do often, but it happens. Yeah. How her energy shifts because she can feel the disconnect. Yeah. She can feel the, so presence, honestly, just not just because presence is a big thing, <laughs> but that presence, knowing that like you're available emotionally, physically, time-wise, and that like you got her. You know, mm-hmm. like whenever Steph lifts her out of the car or picks her up, he always says, Papa's got you. And I'm sure he'll say that for the rest of her life. And I think that gives her a very healthy relationship with the masculine. If I can trust the masculine, they're consistent. That's the other thing. Presence and consistency. Mm. They're consistent. They're present. And I can, I can really count on the masculine. I think that that will help her at any age. Hmm. Thank you so much for that. That's uh, feels like something I can do. And oh, I know you. <laughs> there will be challenging moments, but it's like it's simple. You know, there's no special uh, thing that I have to do. You know, it's it, I just have to give her the everything that I am in each moment when I'm there, and uh, and not let devices and my mind and all of the adult issues that are rolling around in there, uh, cloud that relationship. Right. Yeah. Right. That's it. Ah, thank you so much for this conversation, Christine. It's been nourishing for me and mm-hmm. enlightening. And I, you know, I've really appreciated getting to know you here. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thanks for the questions and giving me the opportunity to share about some things that are new in my life too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And thank you for inspiring me as a, as a, uh, you know, aspiring parent. I love speaking with parents and watching parents who are killing it and just really, um, just figuring out how to live a life in balance while being a conscious parent and, um, you know, keeping your feet on the ground, keeping your business rolling and, and just keeping your priorities in check and, and just, um, adapting and rolling with the punches. So thank you for being an inspiration. My pleasure. My pleasure. How can people find you, follow you, and get more involved with you if they want more of of Christine Hassler? Um, Well, the best way and the thing I'm most active on is my podcast. Um, I'm not a big social media person. I'm on Instagram. You can follow me there. I think I, I don't think I posted in a month. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be really active and then I had a baby. Um, so yes, I'm, I will be back on Instagram and then the podcast is over it and on with it over it and on with it. I love it. Okay. We'll put all the links in, in, uh, the description and thank you, Christine. All the best. My pleasure. Thank you, Ben.